Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second uh, webinar on the EU Marie Skodowska Curie Actions Postdoctoral Fellowship called 2021 with hosting offers from Europe. I am Samrat Kumar, country coordinator for your access here in India. This webinar uh, is organized together in partnership with the delegation of the European Union to India and with the kind support of the embassies of Austria, Finland and Poland here in India. It gives me immense pleasure to see how many of you are joining, have joined us today, not only from India, but also from other parts of South Asia and Europe as well. And that makes us even more happy. Let me say that the MSCA Postdoctoral Fellowship is one of the best funded programs in the world. It's enabling researchers and scientists from all over the globe to conduct their postdoctoral research in any host institution in Europe. The goal of the MSCA Postdoctoral Fellowship is to enhance the creative and innovative potential of researchers holding a PhD and who wish to acquire new skills through advanced training, international, intersectoral, and interdisciplinary mobility. The MSCA Postdoctoral Fellowship is open to excellent researchers of any nationality, as I already said, and it also encourages researchers to work on research and innovation projects in the non-academic sector. And it's also open to researchers with high potential who are seeking to restart their research career. Today, we will give you a concrete overview about the 2021 MSCAPF call. And you will also learn about hosting offers from European countries, which are Austria, Finland, and Poland. I would like to welcome now, first of all, our colleagues from the delegation of the European Union here in India. Um, I hope Tania Friedrichs has uh, joined us. Tania, are you with us? I was with you all along. <laughs> Wonderful. Tania, welcome. I'm happy uh, to have you again with us here. Tania Friedrichs is the Minister Councillor, the Head of the Research Innovation Section at the EU delegation. And we also have, uh, she has brought her team, which is uh, Dr. Vivek Dham. He's uh, the uh, advisor at the research innovation section and Mr. Kinshit Bihani, who is today's presenter. He's also advisor at the uh, research innovation sections. A very warm welcome to Kinshit and uh, Vivek as well. And now uh, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome our presenters, our colleagues, from Europe, and let me start with welcoming our colleagues from Austria. First of all, a warm welcome to uh, Ms. Therese Lindahl. She's MSc National Contact Point at the Austrian Promotion Agency in Austria. Welcome, Therese. Nice to have you with us. Thank you. Hello. Next, uh, her colleague, uh, Alena Morrison. She's EU Program Manager, Research Services and Career Development at the University of Vienna. Welcome, Alena. Thank you, good morning, everyone. And we also would like to welcome Dr. Bedana Bapuli, uh, who is a legal advisor and senior EU expert at the Austrian Academy of Sciences Grant Service. Welcome, uh, Dr. Bedana. Good afternoon, pleased to be back. Also, I'm happy to uh, welcome our colleagues from Finland. First, uh, Dr. Juho Russo. He's a professor of computer science at Aalto University. Welcome, Professor Russo. Thank you. Uh, nice, nice to be here. Next, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Jukka Seppela, professor of polymer technology and Weisstein School of Chemical Engineering, also Aalto University. Welcome, Professor Seppela. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And also from Finland, we have Mr. Mika Rantakoko, license manager at the University of Aulu. Welcome, uh, Mika. Hello, and thank you very much for having this opportunity. Lastly, we are very happy to welcome our colleagues from uh, Poland. Uh, let me start with uh, welcoming Dr. Anna Koteja Kunecka, project support specialist at the Project Support Center at the Jagiellonian University. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Yeah, very correctly. Nice to see you guys. Hello. 
And also a warm welcome to uh, Mr. Marcin Pasternak. He's a research and teaching assistant at the Department of Pharmacology at the Jagiellonian Universal Medical College in Krakow. Martin, Marcin, uh, a warm welcome to you as well. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so before we start uh, with giving you an overview of the webinar and with the first uh, presentation, I would also ask um, Tanya to uh, say a few words uh, about today's webinar and to our uh, colleagues and also our participants. Um, yes, very much. Um, on my turn, um, good morning in Europe, good afternoon in India, and uh, uh, just like uh, my colleague from Iraq says, Samrat Kumar, I would like to thank all the uh, participants. We have uh, uh, many today, three per country. Um, this is really a um, fantastic uh, opportunity um, that we have to promote our success story among Horizon Europe, which is the Marie Swarovska Curie um, action. Um, and um, I'm also so grateful that we have so many uh, participants. Um, we cannot have enough participants because um, science is important, but it has become even more important. We've seen this during the pandemic. We see it that for all our challenges, it's, it's not because all our attention is not on the pandemic, that the other challenges like climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, digitalization has gone to the country. So we need a lot of scientists. We need you with creative ideas that uh, can be developed and can help us find solutions. So without further delay, I um, repeat all the thanks and the welcomes that my dear colleague from Araxes uh, has already done in his uh, introduction. And uh, over to uh, the, my colleague from the section, um, uh, Kinshid Bihani, who will do the general presentation. And then we're very much looking forward to the concrete offers that our uh, member states have uh, to share with you. So um, a nice team Europe approach. Thank you very much for being with us and looking forward to the session as well. Thank you so much, uh, Tania. Let me just uh, uh, share a, a few details about the webinar with our participants and also uh, uh, remind them about our last webinar on uh, hosting offers under the Maurice Grosso Curie Postdoctoral Fellowship, which will happen on 29th of June, where we will have uh, representatives from Czechia, France, Portugal, and Spain. And before we hand over the mic to uh, Kinshid, uh, let me just give you an overview of house rules of today. If you are facing any technical issues, please first try to log out, log in. That should solve most of the technical issues in our experience. Kindly post your questions only in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. That makes life for us easier to help you to answer them. And after each session, we will also have a Q&A with the presenters. And if your questions are not being answered, please uh, forgive us. Uh, but you can contact us or the speakers directly after the event. And uh, don't worry, we will send you a follow-up email with the link to the presentations and also to the recording of today's webinar. And we will be very happy to receive also your feedback uh, about today's webinar by writing to indiadirectus.net. Okay, without any further delay, um, I, I kindly ask now uh, our colleague uh, Kinshit Bihani, uh, to um, uh, give his presentations on the overview of the uh, of the call. We just have to uh, upload for a second the presentation. Yes, one second. I'm just putting up your presentation. Just bear with me one second. Okay, here we go. Um, Okay, are you able to see it, Kinshit? Yeah, the first time. Okay. Yeah, oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. Hello, everyone. Uh, 
let me start by saying that i mean the first thing i, I did while preparing this presentation was about knowing the person whom, on whom the fellowship is named after and i learned few things about uh, and probably you guys already know this, but I thought it is worth sharing. The first women to win a Nobel Prize. The first person and the only women to win two Nobel Prizes. The only person to win the prize in, in two scientific disciplines, and that's physics and chemistry. Uh, thinks more about her, her husband, her daughter, her son-in-law, were all Nobel laureates. The fact that she came from east side of the Europe uh, settled in the West, I mean, did her research and had a fa created a noble family, kind of tells a lot about the lady, I mean, that we should all be knowing. So in a sense, I mean, she worked in different fields. The fact that she was able to uh, work in different geographies tells a lot about her, I mean, and why she was, the fellowship is named after her. Her legacy continues now for more than 25 years. The fellowship started in 1994. Two years later, it was named after her. The number of fellows, as you see, can see, 145, 100,000, and it is still counting. The fact that there are already nine Nobel laureates associated with the fellowship, either as a supervisor or people who themselves were fellow ones. And the last fact I, I discovered myself was that uh, an MSCF fellow went on to win an Oscar too. So I mean, uh, Besides research, there is another option as well in case you do get a chance. This was for a technical field uh, and it was in 2006. I let you find out the movie it was for. Next slide, please. As you can see uh, on this slide, the MSC is part of Horizon Europe. It's a big uh, European Commission program, billions of dollars. It runs from 2021 to 2027. As you can see, it has many components, but probably focusing on the pillar two, it covers almost the length and breadth of science. If you focus on pillar three, it has all the innovation dimension. And if you focus on pillar one, it has this MSCA action. The pillar one is much more about individuals, mobility, excellent research, blue sky research. Our MSCA is, will be, I mean, uh, we'll be talking about more on the pillar one. Next slide. Uh, it's a 6.6 .6 billion euros program. As you can see, there are many components to it, doctoral, staff exchanges, public outreach events. For today's presentation, we are focusing on the postdoctoral fellowships. Next slide. So what makes the PF uh, great? And I think I tried to summarize this in four points. The first point uh, that I would like to highlight here is your choice. The fact that as a researcher, you are able to, I mean, define your research goals, define the research, I think that makes it very attractive. It's not a top-down uh, uh, approach, it's bottom-up. You, along with your supervisor, decide on your research topic. I think that's something I find very interesting. The second part is upgrading. I think as individuals and as researchers, I think it's a great opportunity for you to keep upgrading yourself. I mean, on all aspects of your training, on your skills, and this is where this fellowship is very great because it gives you components in the fellowship where you can uh, leverage those components to enhance your career. The third po point is mobility. So we are looking at fellows who work beyond borders, who work intersectorally, just not in a research lab, but probably also work with uh, uh, labs in the sense, other labs or industry. And the fact that it's interdisciplinary, that's how like Marie Curie did. So you can focus on multiple subjects as well. Uh, there's more features to it, like the exposure to the non-academic sector. So if you are a researcher who think there is a potential for your technologies or research to spill out into the industry, there is an option in the non-academic sector in the fellowship as well. Next slide, please. Coming to the research areas, as you can see on the uh, your screen, there are eight of them and I think if you will see, they cover length and breadth of science that you want to uh, do. Again, I mean, in a, inherently they are interdisciplinary. So yes, you could have an engineering sub subject with a bit of humanities or social sciences, but I mean, for the sake of uh, segregation, this has been broadly defined into eight categories. These are all bottom up. There has been a novelty of the uratum. This is where uh, related to nuclear research, 
But again, this is restricted to the nationals or long-term residents of the EU member states or countries associated to Iraq. Next slide. Uh, Postdoctoral fellowships. I mean, we are looking at two broad categories. One is the European and the global. Global one. The European one is where a researcher from any third country, let's say India, who wants to go to Europe, or a researcher who is already, uh, let's say, an Indian who is already working in Europe, wants to continue the research in Europe. Obviously, there are some uh, criteria that you need to follow. Then the other is the uh, global fellowship, and this is for EU nationals. Uh, member state residents who want to go to a third country, let's say come back to India. There's a widening fellowship or era fellowship as it's called, and we'll talk about it later in the presentation. Now coming to the eligibility, I think this is something you should all be clear about because in the last webinar, there were lots of questions about it. So the first one is the mobility rule is about, you cannot have live, work, or studied for more than 12 months in the last three years prior to the call deadline in the host country. So if you want to go to Finland or Italy or any other country, this is a criteria that you should not have spent more than 12 months in the last three years uh, in that country. It's open to all nationalities, any age. The third is holding the PhD. So uh, there is a final definition about holding the PhD. Even if you have successfully defended and not have not been awarded the degree at the time of call deadline, you can still apply for the uh, call. So that's something you need to bear in mind. And the last one is holding more than eight years of research experience. The idea behind this clause is that the European Commission or uh, the community wants to have more and more of young researchers. So you cannot have more than eight years of research experience after your PhD. Again, there are uh, certain uh, asterisks to this. This work or time spent outside research will not count. Breaks like parental leave, medical leaves also would not count. Next. Next slide, please. It's there. Okay. The slide is there. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is the host institution. So, as the, I mean, who would be able to host you? So, on the left, you have the academic sector, which are the traditional targets, the universities, the research organizations. There are international organizations based in Europe, a research organization. But on the right, you see the non academic sector. And this is something. I mean, introduced for the first time. So you can have your postdoctoral fellowship in industry as well, provided, I mean, it gels with your work experience, your objectives. So that's something that's uh, the commission trying to bring more innovation into this fellowship as well. Now comes the evaluation criteria. So there are three big evaluation criteria. That's uh, all you need to look at. And there is a weightage for each one of them, the excellence, impact, and the implementation. I have I've kind of tried to summarize here in some nouns and adjectives of what your application should focus on. And as you can see, it kind of covers everything from quality to capacity of your host institution, about your supervisor, the quality of your research proposal, your background. So in a sense, your you need a complete package to score high in this uh, fellowship in the application process. So I guess while you are preparing this uh, application, bear in mind these factors. So I guess that will uh, improve your chances as well. Uh, now coming to the novel features. This is exactly about some new things that have been introduced in this fellowship. And the idea here is multifold. Let me start by talking about the secondment phase. In this phase, you can spend a maximum of one third of your duration outside your host institution in other institutions. And this could be an institution across the world. So this could be your institution back in India as well. But again, you need to justify for the secondment. You need to justify why the secondment or this uh, will add value to your uh, application, will add value to your fellowship. 
then there is an additional six months at the end of the project for non-academic sector. So again, let's say if you have spent two years in your fellowship in a research institute, and you see there's a spillover in the uh, non-academic, let's say, industry sector, and you want to spend some six months outside the, uh, extend this uh, fellowship, then there is an option here. Now comes to the seal of excellence. So this is about giving hope to researchers, let's say, who have scored less 85% above, but were not able to uh, secure the fellowship because of lack of funds. So the idea here is, with a seal of excellence, if you go to other institutions, I think this would add real weightage to your application. Again, you need to be clear that you have scored well in the, uh, all the criteria uh, as far as seal of, getting the seal of excellence is concerned. This is more of the administrative and the technical part. So who is involved in this application process? It's you, the applicant, in position of the PhD, the supervisor who is going to supervise your project in the host institution, the beneficiary of the host institution itself who is going to receive the funds, the legal entity. And then there's the administrative coordinator contact, the person in the host institution who is going to look after the administrative affairs. How does this uh, application process work? And this is simple. You need to do the uh, background research, find the institute, find the supervisor with whom uh, you think would be a best fit. You jointly write the proposal with the, uh, your supervisor. The supervisor gets to submit the proposal on your behalf in the uh, funder's portal. Uh, remember one thing, you are only allowed to uh, submit one proposal. You cannot submit more than one because in case you do, the, only the last one submitted would be considered eligible. You get a funding for 12 to 24 months uh, for this fellowship. The institute receives the money and who then recruits you. Uh, okay, this is important. I guess everybody wants to know this and this is about the money. And I think the first look I have of the slide, and I can tell you it's very generous. As you can see on this slide, I mean, it tries to cover you from all possible angles, from the living, mobility, family, even your training. Again, I mean, there is a training uh, component which is quite high. So the idea here is make sure that, I mean, you get the proper training, networking contribution, so that, I mean, you can excel, you can upgrade yourselves. So, I mean, you can focus definitely on your research without having to worry about the finances. And definitely, I mean, you can have a good work-life balance in Europe. Next slide, please. Oh, here comes the list of host countries. So they, as you can see, there are 27 of them, the EU member states, as they are called. So you can uh, apply to any one of them. And then there is a list of associated countries. What exactly the associated countries here, an asterisk here at the associated country means is that these are countries where the negotiation for association is going on with the commission. So most likely, I mean, fingers crossed, everybody would be joining the Horizon Europe program and you can choose one of them. But again, I would have put an asterisk saying that, I mean, you can check for the portal, the funding funders portal, to keep a list of which our countries are eligible or have become associated. So bear this in mind while you're preparing this application. This is something I touched upon early in the presentation, this is called the ERA Fellowship. Uh, let me explain it simply by saying that if you have applied to one of the widening countries, which I'll cover uh, later in the PowerPoint, and if your application is not funded simply due to lack of budget, there is an option uh, in the application saying that, would you like to be considered for the ERA fellowship? And if you do yes, your application gets automatically resubmitted to the ERA fellowship call. So assuming you have done everything right in your normal application in the uh, uh, postdoctoral fellowship, you have scored high, you have scored high on all fronts, and it was simply just due to lack of budget, 
your application stands a second chance with the error fellowship call. And what you need to do is just simply click on a yes. This is something how it will look in the next slide. Or simply saying a yes, and this would allow you to be, become eligible for the ERA fellowship. Here comes the list of widening countries. As you can see, there are 15 of the EU member states. And the idea here is, I mean, to spread the EU research excellence everywhere within Europe. Yes, there are pockets of greater excellence, but yes, there are pockets of excellence in some countries too. So, I mean, the idea here is for you to explore these centers of excellence in these 15 countries. And there is a list of another 12 countries. This, these are also that are uh, most likely to be associated with the widening fellowship. Again, please do check the funders portal for the updated list. On the success rate, as you can see, it's very competitive, 14 to 18 percent. But as you can also see, Indian researchers have been doing well. More than 1,900 of them, they were funded. Yes, we would like the percentage gender by, uh, uh, let's say, balance more. Only 31 percent as of yes, uh, women from India. But yes, there is always a scope. There are 449 of Indian recipients who received this individual fellowship. And as in, as India is not doing bad, we are, uh, I mean, it's just ranked second behind China in terms of number of researchers. Obviously, so probably there's a chance for going to the top. Coming to the deadlines, it's uh, opening on 22nd, closing on 12th October. There is a tentative deadline of the evaluation and the information. And this is something I guess you'll get to know when once you are preparing this presentation. So all I can say is uh, there is a list of websites on the next slide that, that you can keep a tab on while you receive this presentation and check for the latest. And with this, I would like to say thank you. And I hope many of you would be successful and hope to see many of you in Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kinchit, for an excellent overview about the MSCA postdoctor fellowship call. Also, with uh, mentioning these very exciting novelties that you can take secondments worldwide uh, and um, the widening fellowship, the era fellowship, uh, seal of excellence. I think there's so much into this postdoctor fellowship, which makes it quite unique and one of the best in the world. Um, we'll take a, a Kinchit a few questions now. Uh, which um, have come in. And uh, let me just uh, uh, see, have a look, because I was uh, uh, moderating your slides. Um, yeah, one question always comes, does the UK still remain in the MSC program? Can one uh, apply to your, uh, UK institutions, uh, Kinshit? Uh, so the status with uh, Europe, uh, UK is that, I mean, the negotiations are still on. Uh, and I would reiterate my stand that please check the funders portal for the latest. These are because very evolving conditions. As of today, the discussions are going on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Kinshit. And another question, uh, what about um, regular faculty members working in state universities? Uh, are they able to apply? for the fellowship, it's open to yeah. anyone, right? Yes, why not? I mean, you are more than welcome to apply. You just need to fill the eligibility criteria. There's one question about, uh, does teaching uh, experience count as research experience? Like if, if somebody has been uh, um, teaching at the university, is that also counted as research experience? Uh, I would say to the best of my understanding, it would not count as a research experience. I mean, it's a pure research experience that we are looking at, eight years of research experience. Yeah, I, 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 would, I, would, I would second that. Um, there's another question, Akinshit. Um, as from 2022, resubmission restrictions will apply for applications that received a score below 70% the previous year. Uh, please elaborate on this. That would mean that uh, one cannot uh, apply again, you know, uh, the, the year after. 
Yes, so the idea probably here is to, uh, for applicants who have scored less than 70% in the previous years, they would not be eligible to apply for the next year. And probably I think it would be uh, in the next uh, call. And probably what I understand from this is that the idea here is it would give you some time to build on your proposal as well. I mean, for you to improve, to upgrade for your proposal so that the next time you submit, there would be a higher probability of you getting the submission. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, can one have multiple supervisors from the host institute or it has to be one supervisor is one question. It's one student, one supervisor. Yeah. Okay. Then I, th I think you already mentioned very clearly about the uh, eligibility about the PhD degree. So if one has submitted but not defended by the call deadline, can one still apply? No, it has to be defended, successfully defended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or a provisional degree or, uh, would also uh, be make one eligible, right? Yes, I mean, a provisional degree that you get after successfully defending. Defending, yeah, yeah. So we have one uh, uh, participant, of, uh, he's, uh, he's Indian, and, but he's currently in Spain. Like how should he approach for the fellowship? Like I suppose that, that person wants to stay on in Europe, but uh, he cannot be in Spain more than 12 months if he wants to apply in Spain, right? Yeah, so you cannot, you should not have lived, worked or started there for more than 12 months in the Spain if you want to uh, continue with your research in Spain. That's her eligibility. Yeah. But in any other European country, he or she could apply, even while being in yes, Europe, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. It would, it, it would be still for that person under the uh, European Fellowship, right? Yes, that's right. You can still apply under the European Fellowship, provided, I mean, you can look at different institutions in different countries. I guess there's lots of options in your field as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, more and more questions are coming in, but uh, we will also uh, try to answer them uh, during the webinar. And I would say now is a good time for us uh, to uh, move to uh, the next part of the webinar, which is uh, giving you an overview, a presentation about uh, universities, institutions in uh, Austria, Finland and Poland who would like to show you what uh, could await you there at their institutions, what offers they would have. and. I would uh, ask uh, our team Austria uh, to, to start with uh, Therese and uh, Elena and Bedana, please. Uh, um, the, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I will um, try to share my screen here. Can you see it now? Yeah, perfect. Great. So um, thank you very much and uh, hello and good afternoon from Vienna. And thank you for the possibility to give you a short impression of Austria and two of our most MSCA active uh, research organizations. My name is Therese Lindahl and I'm uh, the Austrian NCP for the Marie Skodowska Curie Action and I'm working at FFG, the Austrian Research Promotion Agency. And I will just give a very short introduction uh, before I pass the word to Elena Morrison from the University of Vienna and uh, Bidana Bapoli from the Austrian Academy of Sciences. So Austria is located in uh, the very heart of Europe uh, with excellent uh, communication possibilities, cultural life, an amazing nature. I can say I'm allowed to say as I'm not Austrian myself, so I can do a very good promotion here. <laughs> Um, and uh, Austria has uh, 22 public universities and 11 private universities. And uh, on top of this, also 21 universities of applied sciences. So though it's a rather small country, we have uh, quite a lot of um, research organizations. And it is, Austria is also an excellent hub, uh, widely recognized by global organizations and companies. 
and uh, Austria is a research intensive country with um, a gross domestic expenditure on research and development uh, of 3.4, uh, 14%, uh, which is amongst the highest uh, in the world. And uh, for more information on Austria, uh, please check our researcher's guide to Austria and also the Austrian EURACCESS portal where you can find more information about the research organizations and the research funding landscape and a lot of other information, of course, as well. So, FFG, the Austrian Research Promotion Agency, is located in the House of Research in Vienna, and it is Austria's largest funding agency for research and innovation. And of course, uh, we offer a broad uh, range, a wide range of, of national funding programs, but uh, these also have uh, international dimension. So we have cooperation um, and projects with uh, around 65 countries. And uh, there is also a dedicated program for international cooperation beyond Europe. And FFG is the hub of the Austrian national contact points for Horizon Europe. So all NCPs are hosted by FFG. Our main services, we offer um, quite wide range of trainings, for example, uh, in proposal writing for MSCA or also for the European Research Council uh, project, so ERC. Uh, and uh, ex especially these trainings for MSCA and ERC, they are in English. We also offer proposal check service uh, free of charge for um, MSCA applications with an Austrian host organization. And we welcome you to register for our newsletter. Uh, and though it is basically in German, the the um, area about a research career, so about MSCA and ERC and other um, research career relevant information, this is in English. And you can also check out our video about our services. And of course, you're welcome to contact us and you will find the contact details of all, all the NCPs under the link given in the presentation. And uh, in charge of MSA in Austria at FFG is next to me also my colleagues Lil Reif and Jasmin dolak struss And you can find also our contact details um, under the information provided in the slide. And that was actually my very short introduction. And with that, I pass the word to Alena Morrison. Thank you, Therese. Hello, everyone again. Alana Morrison, I think I well now I'm the second non Austrian promoting Austrian <laughs> institution so uh, this is kind of a little bit funny. So I'll give happy to give everyone a very brief over, overview about the University of Vienna and what we offer to those who are interested in applying for a postdoctoral fellowship. So next slide please. So the university has a 650 year history. And we currently have about 90,000 students and 30% of those are uh, from international backgrounds. There's 178 different degree programs and within those there are uh, 6,800 academics working. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see some of the advantages of living and working in Vienna and specifically at the University of Vienna. Um, we're Austria's largest research and educational institution and we do fairly well in uh, a variety of international rankings. Austria, so Vienna specifically, excuse me, is also a very nice place to live. Um, we've ranked very highly in uh, the Mercer quality of life. There was a ranking that came out last week, I think, where we dropped out of the top 10, um, but hopefully that's just COVID related and we'll bounce back again next year. Uh, next slide, please. So here you can see li listed our 15 faculties and five centers. They're dedicated to both uh, basic and applied research. We also have 24 research platforms and they range from plastics in the environment and society to active aging um, and testing the quantum and gravity interface. I'm not going to go into any detail about them specifically and uh, the departments within each of the faculties, but if you want more information, um, we'll have a link to the university's website and you can look at which, which faculty and which department would be most uh, interesting for you. So next slide please. 
So there's two channels for applying for a fellowship at the university, and I hope I do a good job explaining this because it can get we can get a lot of questions about it. Um, so the first is the is what we'll call the regular channel, the regular application process. This is when a supervisor and a fellow agree to work on a proposal together. Uh, they then let us know, and we start working on them together with the application process. The second channel is our expression of interest. And this is a process facilitated by our department, the Research Services and Career Development Department. And we do this as a way to attract more fellows, uh, more applications to the university. So how it works is we have uh, all the supervisors at the university who are interested in working with a fellow, and we list, us, list, list them on our Expression of Interest website. You can then look at the supervisors and decide which one is the best fit for you, um, and then submit an Expression of Interest application. I just also like to mention we advertise the expression of interest worldwide so on your access, for example, is where um, you can find or there, where we had more information about this. So we receive all the applications and they're evaluated. Um, and then the successful applicants and fellows can be uh, sorry the specific successful applicants and their supervisors can then start working on an application together. So you can see the sort of the difference the, the regular applicants, we accept them at any time before the before the, the final uh, application deadline. Um, but for the expression of interest applicants, there's that expression of interest deadline that also has to be met. Um, and this year, unfortunately, the expression of interest is already closed. We had the, the deadline at the beginning of May. But if you're interested in pursuing a fellowship, um, you can always reach out to professors at the university within your field to find out if they'd be interested in, in, in working with you. Um, you can look for professors through a regular Google search, or we have a UFIT page or our research information system, which is called UCRIS. Um, and if you're interested in, in submitting, um, unfortunately, we can't help you find a supervisor. So once you do find a supervisor, we're happy to help, but you have to find a supervisor on your own. Okay. Next slide, please. Great. So this is a list of uh, services that we offer to all applicants, regardless of whether you come through the EOI or the regular channel. Um, probably most useful during the proposal application process are our set text and documents, just to sort of give you information about uh, basic information about the university um, and our success rates and things like that. Um, we also offer workshops uh, and a proposal check, um, as long as we receive proposals uh, early enough in advance. Okay, next slide please. Great, so lastly, um, this is something that we've offered to European fellow applicants uh, this year, so for the 2021 call and also in 2020. It's an extra year of funding, so the top 10 uh, applicants, so top five male and top, time, top five female, uh, as determined by the evaluation scores given by the European Commission, are provided with a third year of salary um, and there anything and they can do anything they want within this third year so additional research or working on publications training grant writing etc it's up to the fellow um, and the supervisor together to decide how this third year is going to be used um so yeah that's for available for applicants this year we're not confirmed that it will be offered again in 2022 but of course we hope so um and just to also mention another couple of advantages to applying with the university and this is uh, available for all applicants is that the postdoc salaries that are paid at the university are based on the collective bargaining agreement so they're actually higher than the salary that's funded by the commission uh, salaries are paid 14 times a year which is also very nice um, and the university also offers other options uh, such as flexible working hours child care and language learning facilities okay. so next slide and this is it but if you want any information or to contact us, all the uh, information is here. And thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you, Eleanor. Here comes the third Austrian representative, at least half Indian, presenting the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Next slide, please, Therese. So if we zoom in successfully, this is going to take you to downtown uh, Vienna, um, the location of our main building of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. If it doesn't work out, 
no matter you will have the slides and you can zoom in yourself. The next slide, please. Um, the Austrian Academy of Sciences was founded in 1847 as a learned society, which still is home to 760 members of the learned society, similar as the Royal Society, but also uh, acting as the largest non-university research performing uh, organization in Austria, home to 1,800 employees, uh, including also administrative and technical staff, of course, managerial staff, whereas around 836 um, are of international background. And we even host a small but beautiful Indian community of 13 re 30 researchers in our uh, institutes. Our statutory mission is to promote science in every way by pushing the frontiers of knowledge by uh, undertaking innovative basic research, fostering interdisciplinary exchange and um, promoting progress in science and society. The next slide, please. We host um, 25 institutes all over Austria uh, in five cities. You will also have all the 25 uh, institutes enumerated with links to the institutes and their research focus um, in the slides that you will receive as PDF. The next slide, please, shows you in which fields the Academy is active. It's in the social sciences and humanities, archaeology, even Asian studies, social anthropology, with even um, focus on Indian Buddhist philosophy, religious history of Hindu traditions and the like, social sciences, uh, focus on various uh, domains, the life sciences, mathematics, physics, space research and material sciences, whereas these fields are seem to be still until now the most attractive for international, especially Indian researchers. In the field of physics, we have FOTC on quantum optics and quantum information, particle physics, subatomic physics, space research, um, bioacoustics, machine learning, computer sciences, etc., etc. We have attracted so far, and here we are quite nicely performing, and we want to keep this performance. 57 ERC grantees and the same uh, amount of Marie Sklodowska Curie uh, grantees, whom we hope to push to the next stage of their career, which could even be an ERC grant in the future. So how does the uh, uh, application look like if you want to join with the Marie Sklodowska Curie Postdoctoral Fellowship to the Academy? This is shown in the next slide. Um, it's a quite a simple process. It's very similar as the one Alana has explained for the university. There's an open call for the expression of interest. You just have to do three things. First, find the supervisor. You, we have um, a list that's interlinked in the slides uh, with institutes uh, proactively searching in their research for um, fellows but you are uh, also welcome to search the web and to find a potential supervisor and to contact them individual. Second, you please send in a template which corresponds to the uh, Marie Sklodowska Curie template and a one pager uh, stating your motivation, how to do it. You certify that you fulfill the eligibility criteria. You do that please by the 29th of um, June and you send it to the grant service. Next slide, please. The selection of the applicants will be done by the supervisor and the applicants will be informed by mid-July whether they will be accepted and then starts the real uh, adventure. Next slide, please. You're going to develop your proposal with the supervisor with the support by the grant service um, that provides consultation, which means proposal feedback, information, 
uh, by uh, promoting internal guidance documents, by promoting also training formats for supervisors as well as for applicants that complement and are supported by FFG, of course, and we help you with the internal clearance. The deadline is very well known to you by now. We have an internal deadline which uh, closes on the 20th of uh, 27th of September for the submission of the proposal itself. We offer a uh, next slide, please. Uh, besides uh, an inspiring academic atmosphere, top class infrastructure, global networks that foster also allow uh, and allow for a collaboration with academies worldwide, with universities and industry. So here, nice perspectives for secondments might incur or even uh, for uh, uh, teaching opportunities. A lot of career and training services are offered and also career development guidance. On the next slide, you will also find internal funding programs that are uh, governed by the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And we also are about to develop a nice uh, add-on. And this is uh, for seal of excellence applications. We plan to uh, open up a funding program to support the best two researchers who have no opportunity to be funded by EU funds due to budgetary reasons, but have excellent marks and the seal of excellence. So we want to give them a second chance. We have other support services that you will find here with links. And I uh, hope that uh, the brightest minds, the most innovative ideas uh, for exchanging know-how with you, for gaining also your expertise and attracting you to the academy and giving us the opportunity to foster your talent and boosting your career uh, will be attractive to you. And I hope with the next two slides to welcome you uh, at the academy, Donna Bat. Thank you so much uh, uh, to Therese, Alena and also uh, Bedana for giving us like a great uh, plate of offers uh, which uh, Austria has for uh, researchers from India, but also from other parts. And I'm even considering myself now to contact you afterwards for uh, uh, applying maybe for the postdoc fellowship. Um, I think it was really great. And uh, please uh, participants, this is a fantastic opportunity which you have just been uh, uh, exposed to. And I, I would kindly ask uh, our uh, three colleagues from Austria to stay with us uh, for the remaining uh, session. And we will do a, a Q&A at the end. Uh, I think um, then we will have a, you know, a good uh, bouquet of questions. And I will then uh, selectively ask you uh, to help me, to help us to answer them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, we, we go now. We go now from the center of Europe to the Nordic. We go to Finland. Okay. Maybe. Maybe if I could start. Maybe Jukka Seppala. Sure. Is it okay? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I share my screen and. Um, Could you please indicate if you see my screen? Perfect, yes. Yeah, so I'm very pleased to, to introduce uh, Aalto University that is located in the Northern uh, uh, Europe, one of the Nordic countries in, in Europe. Uh, as you see in the, in the map, uh, uh, I, I will uh, focus mostly on the chemical engineering and especially there on one of the flagships uh, called Finseres. Uh, Alta University is uh, a combination of uh, high level science and technology and engineering uh, combined with uh, business and economics and arts and design. We, our slogan says that it's a place where uh, science and art meet uh, uh, technology and business. So we are all, not only science university, but we very much promote uh, innovations also at the same time. Uh, we are multidisciplinary. Uh, we cover uh, most of the fields in uh, technology from ICT and digitalization to 
health and well-being to materials research uh, to to process technologies and uh, process uh, engineering to biotechnologies etc just to mention a couple of uh, fields in the school of chemical engineering we we uh, you can see on the on the right hand side uh, like the uh, breakdown of the uh, of the fields and and their proportions quite equally we we have professorships in uh, chemistry we give a very good and solid basis in chemistry to our students uh, uh, but very essentially it's combined to the chemical engineering knowledge and substances also we have uh, industrial biotechnology and very characteristically we have uh, uh, bio uh, refine, uh, refining, especially forest-based uh, biomass refining uh, in our uh, school. Lignocellulosic research is very import, uh, important in Finland, having very strong forest industry in the Northern Europe. Um, uh, so, so this chemical engineering feature combined with uh, natural sciences is is key key element uh, by us. In the whole Alto University, we do have like. Uh, uh, 12,000 plus uh, the number of full-time students. We have 400 professors. In the School of Chemical Engineering, the number of professors is around 50. Uh, we constantly recruit uh, uh, postdoc uh, uh, researchers. Uh, key element, of course, in uh, those recruitments is to to like uh, have a have a bridge to all uh, to have a contact to the supervisor, um, very good platform in, in for that, uh, and we have already some tens, I would say twenty to thirty um, uh, postdocs only in this uh, flagship program called Finceres. It is uh, lignocellulosics. Uh, uh, research uh, flagship, uh, very wide networking uh, research program. It's very long uh, standing, uh, long period, and it is also networked uh, to the local uh, industries. So it uh, focuses uh, to valorize uh, uh, bio-based raw materials, uh, primarily forest-based, uh, towards uh, like uh, sustainable uh, high value added products and functions, not only to uh, make cellulose, uh, not only to make paper, but to refine sustainable novel materials, maybe to replace conventional fossil based solutions and like, like plastics. Uh, we collaborate in FinSeres together with um, uh, uh, technical Research Center of uh, Finland, VTT, uh, that is uh, a research unit for applied research. Uh, and uh, here you see more what I already said, said about, uh, uh, about the focus in FinService research. Uh, it is like to know the basic chemistry of lign lignocellulosics. Uh, to make novel solutions uh, in materials. Um, fibers are very important to replace like cotton kind of uh, fibers with uh, sustainable forest-based uh, novel uh, innovative technologies, for example, by utilizing ionic liquids uh, for regeneration. Uh, composites based on lignocellulose 6 materials are important uh, up to making like uh, novel uh, electronics based on those materials. Also some uh, some uh, refined, we speak of biorefining, so biorefinery is, the, is the, uh, the heading that covers also some novel uh, valorization change towards sustainable uh, chemi chemicals and chemical, chemical uh, refining routes. We, we have um, like divided 
the activities in FinCRS to four main uh, like uh, topics areas, future biorefineries, uh, clean air and water can mean like uh, filtering materials, uh, capturing uh, heavy metals, for example, or even CO2, uh, uh, plastic uh, replacing lignum cellulose products, and then uh, high performing uh, like uh, novel materials for uh, electronics, optics, energy uh, applications. Uh, so th this is one example. We have uh, plenty of other similar uh, networks and, and research activities. Uh, if you have interest, please have a look on, on, on these uh, uh, websites. You find more information of Altos, uh, all the schools, all the research groups, individual researchers, and also we have certain uh, support for uh, applicants. I hope you have interest to come to Finland, um, um, bind the connection to supervisors. Uh, uh, we look forward to collaborate with uh, uh, emerging talents in, in the field. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Seppala. And um, who would like to go next uh, from the Finnish maybe, side? Maybe I can go. So, yeah. okay. okay, okay, Professor Russo. Do you see my screen? Yeah, could you put it in full screen mode? Yes, Is it? yes. Okay now? Uh, I'm, I'm just seeing black, I'm seeing black. Aha, uh -huh. so but, maybe. Uh, maybe the others are seeing it? I no, know. it's black also in my end. Okay, so I should now. I, um, now we see something, yeah. Yeah, maybe I should just make it bigger, but not full screen. This one can sometimes. Is it? Yes, it's very good. This no? is very good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So so thank you for the opportunity to to, to come to speak here. Um, so let me start with the personal uh, experience. I, I was a Marie Curie Fellow in two thousand three to two thousand and five, and. I can very warmly recommend that. That was pretty much, uh, I, had, I think I had, had my best time of my life that two years. And also it was very important for my future career. So I probably wouldn't be a professor without that experience earlier in my, in my career. So very warmly, I can recommend this, this uh, Mary, Mary Skolodov's Curie uh, project. Okay, so I'm here to talk about the Finnish Center of Artificial Intelligence, or FKI for short. And, and what is this center? So it's a flagship uh, like the FinCERES that Jukka was talking about uh, previously. So this is um, a center nominated by Academy of Finland for a period of time. So it's 2019-2026. And there are three institutes um, Alto University, University of Helsinki, and VTT, uh, that are the kind of the initiating organizations. So these could be your host institu institutions if you would come to come to uh, come to this this um, uh, this route. Right. Um, yeah. So so what is the, what is the uh, mission of FKI? So it's shortly shortly here. It, uh, FKI aims to create new types of artificial intelligence, uh, which can operate with humans in the complex world, and, uh, and to renew the Finnish industry and society with this real AI. So, so we have this kind of national mission because it's a national, national uh, uh, flagship, but of course this is very much interconnected to uh, high-level international uh, research. Um, yeah, so it's a community of experts that bring to, uh, together top talents in academia, industry, and public sector to, to solve real problems uh, with artificial intelligence. And uh, here you can see some numbers of, of, of the units or how the volume. So basically, we have 60 professors with the research groups um, uh, affiliated with, with the unit, um, uh, some 40 million uh, plus funding annually. Uh, and here I, you can see the research output. Uh, uh, so this was just for last year. So you can see it's, it's a pretty, pretty big, big uh, center. And uh, uh, 
we are also part of the European community for artificial intelligence. And so, so there is um, a research network called ELIS, uh, which is the European Machine Learning Research Network. And we are hosting one of the units of, of that network. Uh, so, so we have we are kind of tightly tightly collaborating with our European European partners through through Ellis Network. Right. Um, so then, uh, okay. So what what are the topics? So there, are, of course, is lots lots going on because we have uh, 60, 60 professors with their groups. But here you can see some of the the main. Uh, 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 topics so we have research programs in in these kind of uh, topics so if you are in ai you probably recognize most of these these concepts already so we have uh, uh, probabilistic ai uh, deep learning uh, privacy and security in ai then interactive uh, issues and and uh, then ai in society um, so that's kind of the basic research oriented uh, direction of the center but then of course we have uh, uh, lots of um, uh, topics that go towards applications so for example healthcare or uh, atmospheric ai so basically climate uh, climate research and materials design so this is also kind of uh, linking towards the the black ship yuka was talking about um, earlier Okay, so how to how to kind of get get uh, contact uh, in contact with us? So I, I suggest to go through these uh, uh, web links. So fki.fi, and you have the researchers uh, under that 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 website, and you can go and study what are these researchers doing. So well, that's one 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 way to to kind of explore. Uh, of course, you can go and look at the, the, the research page of the, of the unit as, as well. Um, so, so from this research page, you can find potentially professors you would like to contact uh, and ask whether they want to be a, be a, a supervisor. Uh, but you can also contact uh, uh, through this email address, uh, and there you will have um, uh, administrative personnel of the unit who will then help you go forward. Um, but I have to say that uh, it, it's good to personally contact the, the potential supervisor in any way. So that's that's probably the best way to get, get forward. Um, right. Um, so what else? OK, so I just have one, one slide of showing some highlights of the research. Just um, kind of as a taster of what kind of topics are, are people working on. Um, so there, there are topics in agri agriculture, plant breeding, uh, security, priori, privacy, preserving, uh, artificial intelligence, speech recognition, uh, all kinds of societal questions, uh, computer vision, uh, and then this kind of um, mobile phone related, related um, application and this is just a taster there are of course lots of things going on as well um, right so that's basically it um, yeah so if you if you look at the website you will find find lots of uh, uh, stuff here and there are also link, uh, twitter and, and and linkedin and youtube uh, accounts of, of the sender also if you want to access access those um, so that's basically it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Russo. And uh, now our last uh, uh, presenter from Finland, uh, uh, Mika Ramta Koko. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you can see my screen and can you can hear me. We can hear you, but the screen is mm. black to me. Am I, am I the only one? No, it was black also to Finland. Okay. Hi, Mika here again. I just uh, was uh, thrown out, but now back online again. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, no, and we can see. Nicely visible. And you can see me. Excellent. Per so perfect. Perfect. My name is Mika Rantakokko and I'm coming from University of Oulu in Northern Finland, uh, 50 minutes from our capital Helsinki, 
so pretty close. Uh, that's one of our strengths here in Finland. Uh, we are pretty close to each other, so collaborating quite a lot, even in national level. I will give you a view of uh, our university and our 6G research, especially what we are doing here and the possibilities to join us, uh, hopefully, in, in the future. Our university is founded in 1958 with uh, more than 60,000 uh, alumni. We are a multidisciplinary research and education university with uh, different uh, disciplines uh, as uh, my also my fellow colleagues here. Different disciplines are also here in all university. We are in, in top 3% of in, in global comparison uh, when comparing uh, our university and uh, in 250 to 500 ranking all, all in, in overall ranking uh, comparison. But of course, the very latest and uh, nicest from uh, our ICT related research, it was pretty nice to see uh, I'll, I'll get this uh, Shanghai ranking 2021 in telecommunication engineering, which is now 46 in, in global comparison, which is pretty nice. As said, we are a multidisciplinary university. That means uh, our strategic areas are also multidisciplinary. We are working uh, with uh, digitalization issues, lifelong health, sustainability issues, changing climate and northern environment issues, and also understanding human in this change, which is now taking place uh, also globally. I will not go through all this in detail, but uh, I said you will get this material later, so you can uh, check afterwards so all, all these details from, from this university framework. Then I would... Uh, focus more on our ICT, so our information technology and electrical engineering faculty and, and 6G research. In our faculty, uh, we have uh, a sufficient critical mass of researchers with uh, more than 600 experts working here, with 50 processors, professors, 40 senior research fellows, and with the uh, annual funding of roughly 35 million euros. So in that sense, uh, we could say that uh, our unit uh, where our 6G research is also located is uh, pretty strong in, in the ICT field. And it very much consists of different uh, types of research projects. Uh, our strong portfolio of research projects uh, consists of uh, more than 200 research projects at the moment. And also, uh, if thinking about our research, it, uh, it is uh, also in that sense multidisciplinary as such, uh, stretching from very basics of ICT, from ICT electronics components, uh, radio, artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, all the way to the end user research. So it is a combination of different types of uh, approaches, also creating an interface to other disciplines uh, in our university to really provide this opportunity, for example, to see what kind of opportunities uh, there are in exploiting digitalization and, uh, for example, how we can develop sustainable solutions with help of uh, ICT tools. Concerning uh, our 6G research, uh, as my colleagues here said, uh, they are, we have also been elected as a research unit for, by Finnish Academy to have a, our flagship program. We have been uh, running world's first 6G research program since 2018 with uh, the following focus areas, uh, wireless connectivity, devices and circuit technology, distributed computing and services and applications. During these uh, first years, we have been uh, operating uh, the research with uh, a team of over 400 researchers in, in 6G. And uh, concerning the international opportunities, uh, it is uh, very nice to say that majority of our researchers are coming from abroad. So in that sense, uh, our multicultural uh, research environment uh, is ready for you if you decide to apply for opportunities here in Oulu. 
Concerning the 60, as you might have seen, it is uh, still uh, very much in the research phase. And uh, in this process of uh, developing 60, we have been lucky to be an active builder of a global 60 vision. Among other things, we have been publishing uh, 60 white papers, 13 of them, defining what is our understanding and what is our networks and our global networks understanding of 60. And this framework is also the framework for our research uh, work with ongoing uh, projects and now the next uh, phase of our 60 flagship as well, uh, stretching all the way to the year 2026. This gives, of course, a great opportunity uh, for uh, joining us uh, as a Marie Curie Fellow, but also there are plenty of other opportunities uh, for joining us uh, uh, as a researcher and, and collaborator in the field of 6G. But as uh, I said, uh, we are here in, in Finland, uh, as you might have seen some international comparisons, we are world's happiest country, we are also the most innovative country in the world, most digital and, uh, and the latest achievement according to international comparison, we're also most sustainable country. So if you are interested in this kind of opportunities and uh, framework for studying uh, how we are doing things here in, in Finland and in Oulu, please let us know and uh, send uh, us more information and take a look at our website, uh, our university and also our 6 g flagship website and uh, then we could uh, see how we could uh, start collaborating. The picture here is actually, here on the left side, we have a pitching competition. So you can pitch as long as you like, but there's also this minor detail. You have to do it in the icy water, but uh, the best people have been pitching more than 10 minutes and they have been getting some uh, venture capital funding for sure. Concerning, uh, other activities than the research. We are also a culture city. Uh, Oulu city was actually selected as European capital of culture 2026. And that means that uh, there's also a lot of other things to experience than research here in Oulu. So you would be more than welcome to join and uh, please let uh, us know what are kind of topics you would be interested. Here you can see the links. So you can find more information about the university and how to apply to the university and then also about our faculty and our 60 flagship and also about our city opportunities. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, please uh, let me know if you have uh, any interest or more questions so I would be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, Mika and I think you summarized it so well. Most innovative, most sustainable, uh, very interesting uh, fields of science uh, at the universities in Alto and Oulu as well. And you also have a lot of fun in Finland, as we can see with the pitch bucket challenge and the uh, air guitar world championships. So uh, please, uh, our to, uh, thanks again to our Finnish colleagues. And uh, we kindly ask you to stay with us for the, <coughs> sorry, for the Q and A, which we will have after uh, the last country, which will now present its opportunities. Uh, now from the Nordics, from the north of Europe, we come to the Eastern part of Europe, to Poland. And I welcome again our Polish uh, colleagues and ask them to uh, start their presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the possibility of presenting the country of Maria skłodowska curie a country of Poland. Some say that Poland is located in the east. Others say that it is in the middle of Middle East. You can see the right arrow on the map. Here lays Poland in the world map. And here lays Krakow, my city where I was born and I was raised and I'm living. And I had the pleasure to, to be assistant in Jagiellonian University in Krakow. And as you can see, Krakow lays in the southern Poland. Krakow is a very um, specific and beautiful city, a you know, place to live and place to study. 
it used to be a capital of Poland some centuries ago, but still is kind of capital, some kind of uh, cultural capital and university uh, capital. It is a city of Polish kings. Here you can see the uh, Wawel Castle, the, the castle that is on the hills and uh, just oversees the Krakow. There are plenty of galleries, museums, theaters. Um, Krakow was, as I said, is a cultural um, capital, so it's a city of writers, of poets, painters, but also of sportsmen and tourism. And Jagiellonia University is the oldest university in Poland and one of the oldest in this part of Europe. It was founded in 1964 by King Casimir the Great, the sovereign you can see on a, a 50s Zwarty note. And the current name of the university it came from the different king because in 1914, in 1400, uh, the university was refounded by the king Władysław Jagiełło. So in 1870, just to remember about this fact, about this history, the name was changed, changed to, to honor the second king. The notable alumni from Jagiellonia University uh, Nicholas Kopernikus, Pope John Paul II, uh, Nobel Prize winner Wisława Szymborska, science, science fiction writer Stanislaw Lem, um, famous historian Norman Davis, and uh, founder of UNICEF Ludwig Reichmann. But the university is not only a matter of a past, a matter of history, but let's talk about the present and about the future, maybe. To this day, uh, among achievements, Jagiellonia University is considered as the best university in Poland, according to Perspectives Education Foundation, one of the largest universities in Central Europe, and the only Polish higher education institution in Reuters top 100 Europe's most innovative universities ranking. And it is featured in academic ranking of World Universities 2020, also known as Shanghai ranking. Now, because university wealth comes from universal, it is obvious that it is not only one field of science, but about this topic, you will hear from my colleague from Anna. Oh, okay, you didn't hear me. So, hello everyone. <laughs> um, to make this uh, easier, maybe I would share my screen. So, Martin, okay. would you like to stop sharing your... Of course. On the top, I guess, there's a red place you can click stop sharing. Yes. Yes. So, can you see it? Is yes. It yeah, perfect. Okay, so, yeah, I, I won't have to ask for <laughs> switching the slides this way. Okay, so um, coming to more facts about Jagiellonian University, I would just like to share some numbers uh, that might be interesting for young researchers coming to Jagiellonian University. Um, as 
Martin has mentioned, uh, university means universe, it comes from universe. So there's a wide, wide range of uh, research fields we are um, uh, realizing here at, university, at our university. Um, there are 16 faculties covering a really wide range of research fields. In, this includes um, 158 majors. Um, and I will tell a bit more about this in the next slide. Um, now we have uh, over 4,000 academic teachers and researchers and uh, nearly 40,000 of students, PhD students and postgraduate students. So this is a really huge community of uh, research focused people. Um, apart from faculties, there are also um, six modern research centers that are kind of extra faculty units. Um, Jagiellonian University is a member of 11 international research networks, and um, currently there are almost 1,500 1, ongoing projects. So as I mentioned, there are 16 faculties, um, and we would say this is unity through variety. Uh, so you can choose from uh, law through medicine, computer sciences to geography, geology. So I guess all basic research fields uh, you can imagine. Um, so ranging from humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, technology to medical sciences. Um, so you can choose from this uh, variety of different uh, research fields. And here about medical sciences, it, it is worth to mention that in the Aguilona New University, there's a large independent unit, a medical college, and Martin is uh, the representative of, of this medical college. And uh, this college consists of three faculties, medicine, health sciences, and pharmacy. But what is more important, uh, there is also a university hospital, uh, which is the teaching and research base for, for the Collegium Medicum. So, so for the students, medicine students, this is a really, really great, great place to study and learn the medical um, sciences. Um, in the last 20 years, Jagiellonian University has built and developed a brand new modern campus and already 13 of our faculties, institutes and research centers have their buildings uh, on this campus. And they offer a convenient space for research and education. And it is filled with modern lecture halls, equipped labs, and also leisure zones, both inside the buildings and in the green surrounding, as you can see uh, here in these photos. And as I mentioned before, uh, there are six extra faculty multidisciplinary research centers. Uh, first of them, the Jagiellonian Center of Innovation, uh, is a place uh, that develops and manages the infrastructure of the Life Science Park. And it provides a range of services for entrepreneurs and scientists engaged in life sciences. Uh, then we get the Solaris Synchrotron Center. Uh, this is the first synchrotron built in Poland. It's also a brand new thing, built in 2015. Um, it started its operation with only two beam lines, but ultimately it will house a thousand of them. Um, and this is also a place that uh, offers services for researchers, not only from the Jagiellonian University, but also from the whole region. Uh, another uh, research center is Małpolska Center of Biotechnology. Uh, Małopolska is just the region of, of Poland. This is why it is named Małopolska Center of Bi Biotechnology. Um, and this is an interdisciplinary research center that focuses on innovative research in the field of biological and medical sciences. And it uh, links uh, the scientific results uh, with their pra practical implementation in the private sector. And especially in the last year, uh, the center did a huge, huge work concerning uh, the fight against COVID, COVID pandemic. And there's a lot of uh, projects ongoing on uh, 
searching for new vaccines and cures for, for this COVID uh, disease. Um, the Max Planck Laboratory uh, is a, another research center, which is actually part of the Center of Biotechnology, um, also provides a lot of uh, state-of-art projects, research, Based, basically concerning biotechnology. Um, another large center is Jagiellonian Center for Experimental Therapeutics. Uh, this is a joint initiative of Jagiellonian University with other institutes in Poland. And as a unit uh, that aims to develop experimental pharmacotherapy for civilization diseases, and it collaborates with industry in this area. Um, so, going to uh, another part of the presentation, international col collaboration. Uh, Jagiellonian University is actively collaborating with the universities worldwide. Uh, currently, uh, we have uh, 364 bilateral agreements with universities from coming from 71 countries. So, it's a quite large network of collaboration. And more specifically, we're involved in 11 international networks of universities that are focused on a joint and mutual improvement of research and education quality. Most importantly, we are a part of Una Europa. You can see the logo here in the right up corner. Uh, of Una Europa. This is an alliance of eight leading European uh, research universities that work together for high quality education and research, innovative solutions uh, with a mission uh, to improve uh, the university output. And currently uh, there are more than uh, 1400 projects around uh, at Jagiellonian University. Most of them are national projects funded by the Polish funding agency, the National Science Center. Um, but also there are uh, European research grants. Um, there are 52 ongoing uh, projects financed from Horizon 2020, including 18 Marie Skłodowska Korea actions and three ERC grants and 31 other projects. Also, uh, we have ongoing 44 Erasmus plus projects. Um, and now I think the important information for those young researchers who would like to uh, apply for Marie Skłodowska Curie uh, together with Jagiellonia University. Uh, the university has an independent unit, the Project Support Center, which is exclusively dedicated to handle projects uh, and to help researchers with uh, applying and managing their projects. I am the representative of this unit. And um, here we work in uh, teams that handle with different type of projects. So there is a team for international research programs, European Commission program, programs have a special separate team, uh, national research programs and fellowships, programs for education, science dissemination, and so on. And our role here is to uh, consult and assist our researchers and also researchers from outside who would like to work here uh, in fundraising and searching for funding, uh, and as well as the grant application stage. So we help uh, all the administrative uh, work and formal uh, filling application forms. Uh, also, we can, the researcher can consult with us the project management. Uh, we also perform brokering with between university and funding agencies, and finally evaluate the final reports. Of Project. So actually, this is an assistance just from the very beginning when you are looking for funds to the end of the project when you have to uh, submit the final report. 
Um, additionally, uh, there is a financial administrative support section that handle with um, uh, remuneration eligibility, the formal legal services, and so on. And uh, now we are preparing a kind of booklet or brochure that will present the exact offer of Jagiellonian University for ESRs that are willing to perform their uh, Marie Skłodowska Curie postdoctoral fellowships project at Jagiellonian University. Uh, so this booklet will include the presentation of potential supervisors uh, at our university, description of faculties, facilities, and also we'll give all contact details. Um, this booklet shall be uh, published as soon as possible. I think next week, maybe in two weeks, it will be available on our website. Um, so I really encourage, encourage you right now to um, visit our website and regularly and check for any news uh, and look if the, the booklet is already published. We do not establish yet any internal deadline for contact with our supervisors, but um, I think all this information will be given uh, on our website soon. And if you decide to choose Jagiellonian University for your uh, Marie Skłodowska Curie uh, postdoctoral fellowship, um, you can count on um, our welcome services. This will include administrative services for foreign staff that will be employed in this uh, fellowship. Um, also assistant, assistance at the stage of the employment. So all formal uh, matters related to employment and also some advice and assistance, assistance in formal matters related to stay in Poland. Finally, I would like to encourage you to apply for a Marie Skłodowska Curie postdoctoral fellowships, uh, as this um, nice image says in the world field of Kardashians, be Curie and apply for, for the Marie Skłodowska Curie grants with the Aguilanian University, of course. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much to Anna and Marcin uh, from the Jagiellonian University and giving us a very good, um, exciting overview about the opportunities which are there and also the support services which are waiting for you if you are thinking to apply. And um, I liked your last uh, uh, picture. Uh, that's why not be a Curie. Uh, we need more of uh, Marie Curies in this world, especially in these challenging times. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, thank you so much to all the presenters and if I could kindly ask you to come uh, on back to the screen and also uh, my colleagues uh, from the EU delegation, um, if I could kindly ask you to put on your camera so we all can see each other and uh, the audience as well. Um, so uh, our fingers have been really hot. We have been typing answers. Uh, We've got many answers and uh, thank you to all of you who also helped in, in uh, trying to answer them. We have now a few questions uh, to our presenters and uh, let me start with Austria. Um, so there is a question about the eligibility to apply if uh, uh, somebody is having a contract to work in Austria from March and uh, but before uh, she, uh, she or he she was staying on a D visa earlier is she still eligible to apply for the Marie Skłodowska Curie uh, postdoctoral fellowship? Uh, well, basically, one has to uh, comply with the mobility rule that says that at the point of the deadline, they must not have been in the country for more than twelve months in the past uh, three years before the deadline. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is what you need to fulfill, mm -hmm. um, and and the. Actually, it's, it's a physical because I had a similar qu question uh, in the chat. Uh, it is the physical mobility that counts. So now, mm. because of Corona, the pandemic situation, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, special situations. Uh, so uh, please get in touch directly 
with us and we can, it, maybe it's easier to, to uh, yeah. clarify in a phone call. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a very an email great... to me, and we will we will clarify that. Thank you so much. That's a that's a great offer. And another question: uh, Staying in Austria, are there any uh, uh, engineering uh, fields like uh, disciplines where what could apply uh, under the MSCA in Austria? Yes, yes, of course. So uh, the two host organizations who are presenting themselves here today was just. Uh, uh, a few, some examples of uh, what we offer. So uh, I also answered this uh, question um, in Britain, but uh, and I sent the link to the Austrian Your Access portal where we have an overview of all our uh, our research landscape with the research organizations. But of course, we have technical universities. We have the um, Montana uh, University of Leoben and so on. So of course, yes, they're also technical research oh. going on yes or engineering engineering research going on. Yeah. yes because as you might know we have quite a few uh indian uh, students from the engineering fields who are always interested to continue their studies uh, in europe thank you so much for that um let's go to finland um there was a specific question about uh oh uh, biopolymer uh like uh based on uh a research topic is bio nanomaterials, uh, poly, uh, biopolymer, and is there any chance to do a postdoc or get a permanent position in these topics in, in Finland? I think uh, Professor Seppela, maybe you would be the right person to answer that. Yeah, yeah I'm polymer scientist. So uh, definitely, well, we have, uh, as I explained, we have this uh, bio-based uh, and bio uh, valorization kind of research uh, that, and some of the important areas there are to develop bio-based uh, novel uh, polymeric materials to substitute or to, to make something better than in, uh, to the state of the art like uh, fossil-based, uh, petrochemical-based uh, materials uh, value chain. In addition, we have uh, uh, very strong, extremely internationally uh, strong uh, cluster and 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 professors in uh, biomimetic materials research, bio nano uh, materials research, uh, 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 synthesis, polymer physics, uh, 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 also biochemistry related research uh, like. Uh, uh, like like uh, uh, spider silk, uh, artificial spider silk kind of research, also also uh, uh, super hydrophobic materials research, the kind of um, and very often they are like polymer related. So mm. it is better to have a look on uh, Altos uh, like individual professors and laboratories uh, web pages to identify the most suitable uh, contact uh, laboratories. And mm -hmm, thank you so much. And that would bring me also to the second question to our Finnish colleagues uh, is how to get in contact with potential supervisors now at, at Alto and Ulu University. Uh, should it be like the, the, the projects you have, uh, the flagship projects you have presented, would it be to contact directly you or would one have to go to the department's uh, website and, and look for potential supervisors? Like, could you maybe elaborate on that? Both universities. On Alto's, no. on Alto's behalf, uh, maybe my colleagues will complement and, and add uh, on, on what I say. Um, but but in, in Alto, Alto is so multidisciplinary, so I, I recommend to, uh, to, to use the links I, I, I shared. And, and to see uh, and try to identify the most interesting laboratories and professorships. So, so direct contact is welcome. In addition, um, our uh, Kit Srinivasan uh, is the, is the coordinate, coordinator between us and India. So Kit's uh, email or, or contact information could be shared rather than my uh, email. That, that might work better. I'm too overloaded. I, I cannot... Uh, uh, the, the, this is advisable, and also these flagships usually they have their web pages and contact contact information. That is a good way also. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Mika here also complementing this. I, I think that was exactly the point I was also going to raise. So that uh, in our website, we have a pretty good uh, descriptions of our research groups, for example. So one uh, uh, pragmatic way to proceed would be to contact uh, the research group leads as, as they are responsible of, of the specific topics. And the uh, same applies also to our 6G flagship. As I said, uh, we have these four topics of research and in each of these topics we have a research lead. So if your idea or interest is related to those topics, uh, I, it, I would advise you to contact directly those research leads to discuss a little bit more in detail of, of these opportunities. But if, for example, there is this situation that you are not sure about uh, who to contact or, or what, what is your discipline or how to find the pr- proper contact. So, of course, in that kind of uh, case, so please let me know. I would tr- try to find uh, you a real contact with the substance uh, which is relevant to you. Thank you so much, Mika. Uh, could we stay with you? There is a, a specific question about the 6G program. Uh, one of our attendees is saying that there is it's showing no open position. Um, he or she is very interested in uh, in this program. And is there any opening happening soon for positions in postdocs apart from well, the MSCA? Well, actually, uh, we have uh, an ongoing uh, open process in that sense that uh, you can send in uh, your application or contact for interest to any of these research leads at any time because we are really looking for for uh, candidates to collaborate with okay. all the time so even though oh. they're like uh, officially not like uh, any professorships open or or uh, pro- that kind of positions open, but uh, we are all the time looking for uh, good candidates. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, let us go to uh, Poland. And uh, we have a question, uh, and I think already in your last slides, uh, Anna, you already answered it. The best way to get in contact with potential supervisors, you're actually uh, planning uh, to publish a brochure, which, which I think is a, a great idea. And that's the way to go go, go through you uh, to find potential supervisors? Uh, yeah, so I have given my email in the last slide. So in some cases, you can just text me because I'm the person responsible in our university for, for Maris Kudowska Curie actions. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, in the booklet, we'll have uh, informa- exact information on supervisors who have um, agreed to um, recommend themselves as, as supervisors. And okay. there will be all the information details on the research group and the contact details as well. So this is, I think, the best way. Uh, also, as some of you have said before, um, just searching our website and looking for research teams. There's a real lot, a lot of research teams, research groups in Jagiellonian University, and you can find contacts directly to um, um, professors who maybe are per- performing the research you're interested in. Great, thank you so much. And one specific question is about turbo machinery aircraft engine research at Jagiellonian University. Is there any uh, possibility? Is there any uh, dis- uh, like department working on that? Um, I'm not really aware about this very specific uh, uh, direction. I don't know, Martin, have you, do you have any um, knowledge on this? Unfortunately, not exactly, but it, it sounds like something maybe close to physics uh, from Jagiellonian, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The question but is yeah, very this specific. Is, <laughs> this is a very specific question, and um, Jagiellonian University is um, more basic research um, university, mm-hmm. um, not a technical one. Uh, it's not polytechnics. So um, probably it's not the best place, but maybe I think I, I think uh, this person who asked questions should just browse the website for yes. faculty yeah. of physics and yeah. Yeah, and, and try, try his or her luck there. Okay. Yeah, exactly. um, we have a, a few more uh, minutes and I would like to take some general questions, which uh, you know, I, I would like you to help uh, us to answer. 
uh, one of the recurring questions was, of course, the eligibility of spouses uh, to work in, in the host country. Like, what is the situation for MSC fellows if they come along with, if their spouses come along, can they work in Austria, Finland, Poland? Maybe Austria first? Well, uh, I'm unfortunately not the expert on these questions because we share the responsibilities within, the, mm. we, we are part of the Euraccess network, but uh, the uh, questions about um, visa and, and um, residence mm. permissions, etc., cetera, is uh, provided by the Austrian Exchange Service. So they are actually the expert on this um, area, but you're welcome to send uh, questions also to us and we can always forward them. Mm. Um, so, so I cannot uh, answer that right away. Mm. Uh, of course, there is no specific rule for MSCA uh, fellows, um, the general rules apply. Um, mm. So please get in touch and I will be happy to uh, forward your question to the Austrian Exchange Service. I'm sure they can help. Thank you. I assume the same goes for uh, the Finnish and Polish colleagues that, uh, or do you have an answer to that? I, I think it's the same as uh, Teres said, yes. You should contact the embassy or, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, embassy in Poland. Diplomatic representatives will be helpful for sure mm. in, in this matter. Mm. Yeah, in, Finland, in Finland, very much the same advice. Yeah. Um, but if I if I think about like my postdocs, uh, in ideal cases, uh, the spouses also have found uh, like uh, uh, fellowship or or, or uh, like. Uh, a position according uh, to his or her like uh, profession. So I mm. I can only encourage to be active to search a position uh, in academic or like in, in the private mm -hmm. uh, private sector. Many mm. have been successful in that uh, respect. Uh, so another question, which I think many have experienced, is. Um, that they often don't get a response from the professors in Europe when they write to them and inquire about potential supervision or openings. Uh, any tips, uh, you know, in, in terms of email communication, like uh, have you, you have experienced it maybe from your own experience, if you could maybe share that uh, with us. Maybe one hint is that you really need to make the email personalized to that professor, make it clear that you know what the professor is studying, then it's better chance that you get the reply. If you had send anything generic, that is less likely to be answered. So that's one hint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, answer to like very specific work of this professor. Yeah, so if you read a publication, which is very interesting and you have an idea, mm -hmm. just relate to this specific work so the professor knows that, yeah, this is um, directed to him. Yes, and, and also you can write um, institutional email with, with more, more general questions, uh, more specific to professor and more general to institution maybe that will be a hint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed, I would I also like to compliment on uh, support that uh, because I think we all have uh, all these uh, more generic emails so there you would uh, most certainly get a reply and also there are the people who will link you with the most suitable persons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see Bedana uh, you have raised your hand. Yeah, thank you. Just to, to let you know, if you apply um, responding to the call for the expression of interest, then this is uh, take, being taken care of by the grant service and they support liaising with the professor um, in charge or who could be interested uh, uh, in uh, hosting you as a, a future fellow. And you'll be uh, certainly receiving and uh, a re response, a reply email uh, in the month of July. Great, thank you. And uh, one more question, a last question is, which we often also get in also in today's webinar is, uh, 
job opportunities beyond the postdoc in your countries? Like what, does, what is the perspective for Indian researchers after they've completed the postdoc? Like what job opportunities are there? And uh, yeah. Bedana, you have raised your hand. We you want to... Uh, just again, I'd like to highlight that there are ample of opportunities and the links are given in the slide and including these opportunities are also funding programs that are um, uh, offered by the academy for postdocs, for pre-docs. And uh, so I encourage you to, to search the grants.at website and to look into the links given in the presentation too. Thank you. Uh, Poland. Oh, yeah, mm. yeah, please, please, uh, Professor Jukla. Yeah, thank you. Um, if I would comment this, I, I think uh, one specific feature that 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 exists, at least, at least in Finland and in, in our context, is that very many of our projects, they are connected, uh, networked to, to other research units, research centers, like we mentioned about VTT, uh, State Research Center. But also, uh, very often we have ad advisory boards or collaboration with uh, major companies. So uh, in, in postdoc period, maybe it is very wise to, to, to network to network academically, but also to network to, to the uh, companies and, and other kinds of research, uh, more applied research units. Indeed, in Finland, it is uh, quite common that uh, many of the postdocs or the researchers, uh, PhD students as well, they are working in the collaboration projects where companies are also involved. And it's, uh, it's pretty common that uh, when they then finish the studies, uh, there will be some uh, potential opportunities. So they jump to the companies then. Uh, Poland? Well, as, as Anna said uh, on presentation, uh, you have seen all the research centers and opportunities and very the same like in Finland. Uh, they, they are connected with, 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 with uh, some companies and it, it depends of course on the field, but there are opportunities to, to, mm -hmm. to jump on and to continue either to continue on, on university. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. also such. Or, or go for an uh, European Research Council grant. That could be the next step yes. after the postdoc, yes. which, and we will have a, a dedicated webinar on the ERC at the later stage of, uh, of the year for all of you. And I think we are very good in time. Thank you so much to all of you for sticking to the time of the presentations and giving us really great insight into the opportunities in uh, all of the countries. Um, I also would like to thank uh, um, the EU delegation, uh, Kinshit, uh, for a very great uh, overview about the call. And uh, Tania, last word goes to you. What do you say, Fazit? I wouldn't say last word, but some, certainly I want to echo what what uh, what what you said. Um, I always like to listen as well, and then I think, oh my God, no age limit, no nationality limit. Um, well, like you, you you kind of felt like going to Austria, so I start thinking. Finland was quite attractive. Huh? If I could, um, I would make the dip uh, in, in the cold water. I'm from the North Sea, so that pitch I could stand. <laughs> but, um, but then again, um, I'm very close to Poland, so it would be an extremely difficult choice. And in making that choice, I would also like to say to the audience that, of course, the European Union consists of 27 member states, and uh, most likely, uh, 15, 16, 17 countries associated to a program. So you have a wide choice and a very diverse uh, choice. Uh, I'm saying that because I saw a question in the chat, can I also go to Denmark and Germany? Yes, you can. Uh, it's not limited to the countries that we have selected to be part of or that we had the opportunity to do these joint uh, presentations with. So, um, I, I, I am, ex but I'm extremely happy uh, uh, and pleased with the presentations of today. Uh, it, it helps 
uh, making a choice. It's not a, an easy choice. It's a choice that will determine the, your path, your career path. It will form you, um, I think, only positively. Uh, and especially on a lot of disciplines that, that India also needs. And so after this uh, webinar, uh, I'm speaking now to all the potential um, um, interested scholars, uh, fellows, go for it. Uh, it's, it is very competitive, but you have, have to try it. And in trying it, you don't have to say, oh, I want, I want to go to Finland because it was a nice presentation. What is your added value uh, in doing the research? You have to bring knowledge to the country as well, because it's not charity. It's, as uh, my colleague Kinchit was saying, it's a very generous grant. And uh, so, but the, there is a return of investment for both. And mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I'm saying more then, but, uh, um, fantastic sessions always. I, uh, I always uh, like to listen and to hear it. And I regret that I didn't have that opportunity, take that opportunity despite the age limit. So um, uh, best of luck to the Indian scholars uh, and uh, look carefully at the eligibility conditions that we gave also. The, the, uh, we will have a flyer. It will be put on our website of the European Union delegation. I also would like to make a little bit of publicity for my shop, uh, Samrat. <laughs> so on our website next week, we, have, uh, we will announce, because uh, nobody mentioned, I think, that in fact, that yesterday, uh, so all this information that we're sharing with you is uh, very fresh uh, because the work programs have been adopted yesterday by the European mm -hmm. Commission. So they will be launched. We put them on our website and we will also add the flyers uh, to, to recall again the conditions, the tips, the ways to find a host uh, institute and how to go about it. Uh, for now, have a nice end of the day, evening, afternoon in Europe. Uh, delighted to have met you all and uh, thank you for the students uh, to express interest in Europe as a destination. Thank you so much, Tanya. And I have good news. Uh, we have still one more webinar where we will feature more uh, uh, European countries with hosting offers on June 29. Um, yeah, once again, thanks to everyone uh, for this very exciting and interactive session. Uh, all the best, and we hope that you will get uh, many applications in the coming weeks uh, at your, uh, into your inboxes and queries from our Indian uh, researchers. Have a nice uh, afternoon and evening, and um, yeah, stay tuned. We'll, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye, Europe. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.